I've been playing a lot of Blueprints recently, which might explain my recent upload schedule. For those of you who don't know, Blueprints is a puzzle game, where you're exploring this ever-changing house which is filled with even more puzzles. Now, one of the puzzles in this game is called a Morajai Box. And today, I want to make a real one. After all, how hard can it be? It's just a box with some buttons on it. So I opened up CAD and I started drawing. I started with a drawing of the box found in the game, and I made my initial sketches and outlines from that. Now, it's surprisingly hard to get a good view of the box in the game, so there were a lot of things I just had to guess on, like the exact shape and angle of all the little details on the top of it. But, overall, the CAD was already starting to look just like the box did in the game, which was pretty nice. Right up until I got to the buttons. You see, normally if I needed a square button like this, I just use an arcade button. Now, a normal arcade button like this one is really just a micro switch with a big button assembly on it. And these things are great, I really like them, but it's way too big to fit into the top of the box. But that's easy enough to solve. Instead, I can just use some of these tactile buttons and 3D print a button shell to go on top of it. Now my real problem is color. In the game, there are 10 different colors the buttons can be. Now making a button change color is normally pretty simple, you just use an RGB LED. One problem though is that three of the colors I need are white, gray, and black. Now I don't know about the LEDs you have, but mine can't make anything black. They can only produce light. So for this to work, I'll need a button surface that's black, and hopefully I can shine the light just enough to make it look gray. So I'll need to find the right surface material to make it work. So I print out a couple test buttons. The first one here is just made out of thin black plastic. Now when I shine this fairly bright flashlight through it, you can see that it kind of works. But the flashlight is a pretty bright light and there's not much light actually making it through the button. And plus the light that does is pretty yellow colored. So I wanted to try another thing. For my next one, I printed the top of the button out of clear PLA and put some black masking tape on top of it. And this is maybe a bit worse. Yeah, it's not yellow, but almost no light is making it through. And you can very clearly see the texture of the paper, which isn't really what I want. I'd prefer a much more solid color. Finally, I did the same thing as before, but I colored the top of the button black with uh, some permanent marker. See, this is much better. It's letting a lot more of the light through. Now, it's kind of hard to tell on camera, but there still is a bit of a texture to this. You can see the 3D printed lines in the top of the Sharpie, but it looks white when the light is on, and it looks black when the light is off. So I think this is what I'm going to go with. With that figured out, I could go back and finish the rest of the CAD. So I added the LEDs and the actual switches for the buttons, along with some mounts to keep everything in place. I'll probably just glue this together. Now, I know it's a bit lazy, but it's much easier than designing proper screw mounts. And anyways, I'm sure it won't cause any problems for me later. And with the square buttons in the middle done, I moved on to the corner buttons. These are basically the same as the other buttons, just they're round. That covers the buttons, which are most of the puzzle. Of course, the buttons can't do much by themselves, so I also need to fit a microcontroller and some sort of battery and switch into the lid. While I'm thinking about it, I'll also need to put some sort of latch mechanism into all of this. In the game, when you solve the puzzle, the box just gracefully opens, revealing its contents. Now, I couldn't see any obvious mechanism to make this happen in-game. In fact, I didn't even see hinges on the box in the game. But this is the best way I can think of to get the box unlocked when the puzzle is solved. Ah oh well, I suppose getting the function right is a bit more important than keeping the visuals perfect. So I'll need some sort of latch that the microcontroller can actually actuate, which means I'll want either a servo or a solenoid. And all of these things are going to take up a bit of space. I spent quite a while in CAD trying to get everything to fit, but it can be hard for me to get a good feel of space in CAD. So I printed out the current version of the lid and started trying to fit everything into it. And it quickly became apparent that there wasn't any way to get everything to fit inside the lid as it was. And even the smallest servo I had just was too big to fit in the space available. Not to mention the 9-volt battery. So I made another small sacrifice to game accuracy and made the lid just a little bit deeper. But by doing that I was able to get everything to fit. So I finished up designing the latch. And I added some hinges. 
and we're ready to print. Well, there's one more step left. In the game, the box appears to be made out of two different colors of wood. So I got two colors of wood filled PLA to print this out of. But this by itself still doesn't look all that wood-like. To get that final bit of wood look, I opened a blender and applied a wood texture to the entire mesh. If you want to see exactly how I did this, I've uploaded a full tutorial to my Patreon, linked below. But with the texture applied, I painted on the different colors in Prusa Slicer, and I printed the parts out. Just give me a second to get all the support material removed and get them cleaned up a bit. I think this looks pretty great if I do say so myself. Of course, nothing is working yet, I mean none of the internals are even there. Still, it's nice to see it starting to come together. And besides, that's all an electronics and software problem. I'll just let those guys deal with it. Yeah, so uh, it turns out I'm those guys too. I was kind of hoping to get out of this part. Uh, anyways, I might as well get on with it. So I'll start with the software. The first part being the puzzle itself. Now I don't want to spoil the game too much, so I'll just give you a quick overview. Each of the nine square buttons in the middle of the lid can be one of ten colors, and pressing one of these buttons will cause it, and maybe some of the other buttons, to change their colors as well. Each of the ten colors has its own rules, except for gray, which doesn't do anything. But I don't want to spoil the game for you, so I won't describe exactly what the rules are. If you want to look them up yourself, though, feel free. Now, the goal of the game is to make all four corner tiles the same specific color. So once the corner tile is the correct color, you need to press the adjacent round button, and, if you got that corner right, the round button will light up in the same color. If you're wrong, pressing the round button will reset the puzzle. Once you have all four round buttons lit with the correct colors, the box will open. Now, coding this all up was a bit tedious, but it wasn't anything too difficult. My bigger problem was actually the electronics. You see, for the controller to know that a button is pressed, there needs to be a wire connecting the button to a pin on the controller. And with 13 total buttons, that's 13 pins I'll need to use just to read all the buttons. Now I'm using an Arduino Nano for this, which has 17 pins that I can use, which would leave me with only four extra pins for the LEDs and for the latch. Now true, I could probably get away with this and make it work, but still, I'd rather use fewer pins. As it turns out, there's a pretty cool way I can save some pins with the buttons by using something called a keyboard matrix. As I just mentioned, I could have each switch directly connected to a pin on the controller on one side and five volts on the other. When the switch isn't being pressed, the circuit is broken, and the controller's pin reads 0 volts. Now, if I press the switch, I'll close the circuit, and now the controller will see 5 volts on that pin, which tells it that the switch has been pressed. Now, let's rearrange the circuit. So, instead of connecting all the switches to 5 volts and an Arduino pin, I'll instead have one pin connected to each row of switches, and one pin connected to each of column of switches. Now I'm only using 6 pins, as opposed to the 9 I was using before. But this raises the question, how does the controller know what button is being pressed? There's no voltage at all in the system, so even if a button is pressed, the controller still won't see any voltage. Well, you see, that's actually what makes this work with fewer pins. The controller itself can provide the voltage. I'll set the three pins on the columns to be output pins. When I want to read the state of the buttons, the controller will send a voltage down each column, one at a time. If none of the buttons in the column are pressed, nothing will happen. But, if one of them is pressed, the controller will see a voltage on the corresponding row pin. Since we know both the column and the row, we can uniquely identify the button that was pressed. Now this does have one big downside, and that's what happens if multiple buttons are pressed at once. If each button has its own pin, it doesn't matter how many of them are pressed simultaneously, we'll still know exactly which buttons are being pressed. Now watch what happens if I press three buttons at the same time. The first column is fine we correctly see that two buttons in it are pressed. But hold on, the next column also thinks that two buttons are pressed, even though we're only pressing one button in that column. So why is this happening? The voltage for button 2 is flowing back through the other buttons, making it look like button 5 is pressed, when it's not. And thankfully there's a pretty easy solution to all of this. You just need to put a diode on each button. This diode will prevent the current from flowing backwards through our buttons. Now the controller can accurately tell which button is being pressed, no matter how many buttons I'm pressing at once. All I need to do now is actually solder all this up, so just give me a second while I go and do that.
Next up are the LEDs. Thankfully, these are actually a bit easier than the buttons, since I'm using these addressable WS2812B LEDs. This means I actually only need one pin on the controller to control all the LEDs on this box. Although, I do still need to solder the control wire to each LED, along with the power and ground wires. Which, with 36 individual LEDs, gives me 218 solder pads. So this is going to be a lot of soldering. is a perfect segue to this video's sponsor. Eh, just kidding. But seriously though, if you've been enjoying this video, please consider giving it a like, a comment, and subscribing. It really helps the channel. Now, back to more soldering. Now that all the LEDs and the buttons are wired up, it's time to finally connect them all to the controller. To make sure everything was working, I set the LEDs to cycle between red, green, and blue. And everything's looking good, except these last four LEDs. Now for some reason they're not turning on. So I pulled out my multimeter and I started to check the voltage. I'm seeing about 4.5 volts, which is a little low. It should be closer to 5. But clearly that's not the problem, since the rest of the LEDs are at the same voltage and they're all working. Since it's not a voltage issue, it must be a signal issue. Which means I'll need to pull out my oscilloscope. So to start, I check the signal at the Arduino, and as expected, it's a good signal. And the signal going into the first of the bad LEDs is also looking good. But you can see here that when I probe the output signal from the LED, I'm not really getting anything. It's just stuck high. So that's definitely the problem. In any case, it's an easy enough fix. I just need to swap out that one bad LED for a new one. And once I did that, the whole string of LEDs is now working. Then I wanted to make sure all the buttons were working. So I put together a simple program to light up each LED group when the correct button is pressed. And you can see it's working pretty well. With everything working, I printed off the plastic parts for the buttons. And I glued the LEDs to them and did a quick test fit. That's really exciting to see it all start to come together, but there's still more left to do. Like the latch. Now first I had to connect the latch to the solenoid, and then screw the whole assembly into the lid. Now that it's in, we can see how the latch will work. When you solve the puzzle, the Arduino will activate the solenoid, and the latch will click open. But for that to actually happen, I'll need to put together the solenoid's electronics. First, to get the flyback diode. Since the solenoid is an inductive load, current will still want to flow through it when I turn it off. Without a diode here, this current will just flow back through the MOSFET, which could potentially break it. Now speaking of the MOSFET, I'll have to wire that up now too. Now MOSFET is basically an electronic switch that lets me use the small amount of power the Arduino has to control the large amount of power that the solenoid needs. And now that I knew everything was working, I could start on the final assembly. First I put all the buttons in their spots. Then I glued a small plastic bar to the back of each of them. This is the part that actually makes contact with the switch when you press the button and then all the switches snap into place behind the buttons. Off camera, I glued the switch assembly into the lid, and I was almost done. Or so I thought. So, as you can see, the last row of buttons is not lighting up properly. And turns out, some of the wires got broken in the whole assembly process. So I started digging around in here to try to find them. Unfortunately, since it's all glued together, digging around meant, uh, Pulling these out, I already did one fix right here, but it looks like I'm still not getting these or the four corner buttons. 
But I think to get to that, I'm going to have to take all of these out, at which point I'm just going to have to reprint this whole thing and redo a bunch of this work. So, this will be fun. With a number of broken wires I found, I realized I'd need to completely remake the lid, which I really didn't want to do. But it did give me a chance to fix some minor issues I had found with the lid. I made a couple of screw mounting points more sturdy, and I slightly adjusted the position of the solenoid and the latch. But most importantly, I completely reworked the button mounting plates to make it one solid plate rather than 13 individual ones. Not only will this make the soldering easier, but now it's held on by screws instead of glue. So if I find more broken LEDs later, I'm not going to have to destroy the lid again, I can just unscrew it and pull everything out to access the wiring. This is definitely how I should have done it in the first place, but I was being lazy. So, pro tip. If you're ever considering using glue in your designs, uh, don't. Anyways, with all those issues fixed, I printed out the new button plate. I wired up all the switches, fixed the LED wiring, reprinted and cleaned up the lid, tested the LEDs again, thankfully they're all working this time. So I removed the old wiring from the Arduino, wired in the new switches, installed the latch, colored all the buttons black, I installed the button back plate, and I connected the solenoid to the Arduino. So I was finally back to where I had been, but this time, all the LEDs are working, and the buttons all light up when I press them. All I had left to do now was install the power supply. Now, as you might have noticed, the lid has always been plugged in for everything so far, but I wanted this whole box to be self-contained, and there needs to be a way to turn it on and off. And so for that, I'll need a power switch, a 9-volt battery, a connector for the 9-volt battery, and a voltage converter to step the 9 volts from the battery down to the 5 volts used by the Arduino and the LEDs. So, into the box they go. Then I wire them all together, and I'll hide everything behind a backplate. Now, this ended up being way more work than I thought it would be, but I'm super happy with how this turned out. Anyways, enough of that. Let me get this turned on, and we'll see if I can solve it. <laughs> All right, let me go and get a harder puzzle. It is so fun to finally see this working. Of course, the real test is going to be to see how my wife likes it. She's the real blueprints expert around these parts. Here's the finished box. Ooh. Yeah. Let's turn it on and see if you uh, recognize this one. Hmm. I don't remember where it was or anything, but let's see. I gotta check which color I'm going for. Okay, I'm going for green. Um. Yeah. See, I knew that was your uh, favorite type of room to draft. So. <laughs> ah, true. That's a good point. Um. <laughs> I'm not really sure how I just did that, but... <laughs> well, I had a lot of fun with this one, and I hope you did too. If you want to make one of these for yourselves, all the 3D files are up on printables, and I put my code in the GitHub. Link's in the description. If you enjoyed this project, please consider giving this video a like, and a subscribe if you'd like to see more of this. And as always, thanks for watching.